To better understand vitreoretinal disorders, we must first examine how vision works. In order for one to see, a light source is required. Without light, everything is black. The light emits particles called photons, which bounce off solid objects in all directions before eventually reaching the eye. In order to see well, the tissue that they go through must be transparent. First, the cornea, located at the front of the eye, then the crystalline lens behind the pupil, then the vitreous body in the middle of the eye. Finally, they reach the retina, the eye's photographic plate, stopping at the retinal pigment epithelium, where they set off nerve pulses. These pulses are directed toward the optic nerve and then the optic pathways. before arriving at the occipital brain where the image is formed. This process is what enables us to take in the world around us. At birth, the vitreous body is attached to the retina and stays attached until one day, as part of the natural aging process, it detaches on its own. This is what we call posterior vitreous detachment, which, as it occurs, can cause flashing lights to appear in the peripheral vision, or permanent floaters called myodisopsy. This is due to opaque pieces of vitreous that come between the light source and the retina, causing shadows to appear in the form of hair or clumps of cotton. Because a vitreous detachment can also lead to a retinal detachment, the patient should submit to a retinal exam to assure the absence of danger. If there is a strong adhesion between the retina and the vitreous, the posterior vitreous detachment can cause attraction on the retina. If the retina itself is fragile at that particular point, this can lead to a retinal tear, which will allow the intraocular fluids to go through and detach the retina. In the large majority of within 8 to 15 days, the retina can become retracted because pigment cells will start to form membranes over the surface of the retina. And when the retina is retracted, surgery becomes much more complicated and the chances of healing are severely diminished. The first goal of surgical treatment is to stop the fluids from passing through the tear by plugging it. The pumping done by the pigment epithelium allows the retina to be reattached. To do this, the surgeon first needs to find all the tears or holes, no matter how small, in order to induce an inflammatory reaction on the edges of the holes or tears by cryopexy or laser. This reaction will act as a glue when the tear will be pushed against the pigment epithelium. This can be done in several ways. The doctor can reshape the sclera to push it against the tear by doing a scleral buckle using an explant sutured to the sclera. He can do an internal tamponade by pushing the retina against the pigment epithelium then injecting a bubble of gas into the eye. This bubble will then be absorbed naturally. For complicated cases, a silicon bubble is sometimes used instead, though it must later be removed. Lastly, he could remove the vitreous tractions that caused the detachment in the first place, thus giving the retina back its flexibility. This is called a vitrectomy, or removal of the vitreous. All of these procedures can be done together, as well as with other complementary steps, like membrane dissection or removal of the fluid underneath the retina. Macular syndromes affect the macula, a small 1 to 2 millimeter area located in the center of the retina. This is where the highest concentration of visual cells are found, 
explaining why the macula controls the sharp, clear, central vision necessary for reading, writing, or driving. The rest of the retina is responsible for the less precise vision of the peripheral field. In all macular syndromes, no matter what the cause, retinal vein occlusion, inflammatory disease, post-surgical disease, uncontrolled diabetes, abnormal attachment of the vitreous to the retina, or spontaneous epiretinal membrane of an unknown origin, an edema has been formed in the macula. This edema will then extend and disrupt the nervous cell connections, and thus a good amount of visual input will not be sent to the brain. A continued progressive loss of central visual acuity will follow. The bigger the edema, the more vision that will be lost. In addition, if there are retinal folds caused by the attachment of the vitreous, the patient will experience deformed vision. Little by little, these unconnected cells will irreversibly die. And without any intervention, the patient is falling down the stairs of visual help without hope of returning to the top. The goal of the operation is to stop the vision loss or even potentially obtain a slight improvement. In the majority of cases, the surgeon will likely proceed in the following manner. First, he will do a vitrectomy, that is the removal of the vitreous body with the help of a vitreotome, replacing it with an appropriate liquid. He will then remove the posterior hyaloid, the envelope of the vitreous body, often stuck to the retina. Then he will remove the internal limiting membrane of the retina from the posterior region. This membrane is a very thin film that is only five to six microns thick, or in other words, 10 times thinner than a piece of hair. Not only will doing this help fight the edema and block the process of cellular destruction and thus vision loss, but it will also allow some of the remaining nerve cells to reconnect explaining why it is sometimes possible to recuperate a portion of the lost vision. The macular hole is a macular syndrome that deserves a more detailed explanation. Tangential traction creates a hole in the macula. Fairly rapidly, this hole enlarges and its edges detach. This is accompanied by a large loss of central visual acuity that, without operation, becomes irreversible in the majority of cases. The goal of the operation is to plug this hole, which will stop visual degradation or even improve it a little. The surgeon will proceed as before, doing a vitrectomy, taking off the posterior hyaloid, and the internal limiting membrane of the retina. But he will have to add a gas bubble injection into the patient's eyes in order to close the hole and keep it shut. According to the laws of Archimedes, the gas bubble will naturally rise. In order for the bubble to stay pushing on the macula, the patient will have to keep the macula toward the ceiling, meaning he will need to look in the opposite direction, toward the ground, at his feet. This is what we call the bubble position. This position should be maintained for a few days in order to ensure the healing process.